Yes, Mr. Oldman. May I please the tribunal? With your indulgence, before proceeding with the presentation of the evidence relating to the case of aggressive war against the Soviet Union, I should like to take about 15 minutes to offer two further documents relating to the aggression against Austria. Those two documents are st stapled in a supplementary document book. Sup supplement to document book N. Both documents are correspondence of the British Foreign Office. They have been made available to us through the courtesy of our British colleague. First, I offer an evidence document 3045 PS as ex exhibit USA 127. <coughs> this is in two parts. The first is a letter dated 12 March 1938 from Ambassador Neville Henderson at the British Embassy Berlin to Lord Halifax. <coughs> it reads, my lord, with reference to your telegram number 79 of March 11, I have the honor to transmit to your lordship herewith a copy of a letter which I addressed to Baron von Neurath in accordance with the instructions contained therein and which was delivered on the same evening. The French ambassador addressed a similar letter to Baron von Neurath at the same time. The enclosure is the note of March 11 from the British Embassy to the defendant von Neurath, and I read it as follows. <coughs> Dear Reich Minister, my government are informed that a German ultimatum was delivered this afternoon at, at Vienna, demanding inter alia the resignation of the Chancellor and his replacement by the Minister of the Interior. A new cabinet of which two thirds of the members were to be National Socialists and the readmission of the Austrian Legion to the country with the duty of keeping order in Vienna. I am instructed by my government to represent immediately to the German government that if this report is correct, HMG, meaning His Majesty's government, in the UK feel bound to register a protest in the strongest terms against such use of coercion, backed by force against an independent state in order to create a situation in incompatible with its national independence. As the German Minister for Foreign Affairs has already been informed in London, such action is bound to produce the greatest reactions of which it is impossible to foretell the issues. I now offer document 3287 PS as USA exhibit number 128. This consists of a transmittal from the British Embassy, Berlin, to the British Foreign Office of defendant von Neurath's letter of response, dated 12 March 1938. The letter is identified in the document with the letter L. First, the defendant von Neurath 
objected to the fact that the British government was undertaking the role of protector of Austria's independence. I quote the second paragraph of his letter. In the name of the German government, I must point out here that the Royal British Government has no right to assume the role of a protector of Austria's independence. In the course of diplomatic consultation on the Austrian question, the German government never left any doubt with the Royal British Government <coughs> that the formation of relations between Germany and Austria could not be considered anything but the inner concern of the German people and that it did not affect third power. <coughs> then, in response to the assertions regarding Germany's ultimatum, von Neurath set out what he stated to be the true version of events. I quote the last two long paragraphs of the letter in the English translation. I start at the bottom of page one of the letter. Instead, the former Austrian chancellor announced on the evening of the 9th of March the surprising and arbitrary resolution decided on by himself to hold an election within a few days, which under the prevailing circumstances, and especially according to the details provided for the execution of the election, could and was to have the sole purpose of oppressing politically the predominant majority of the population of Austria. As could have been foreseen, this procedure being a flagrant violation of the agreement of Berchtesgaden, led to a very critical point in Austria's internal situation. It was only natural that the members of the then Austrian cabinet, who had not taken part in the decision for an election, protested very strongly against it. Therefore, a crisis of the cabinet occurred in Vienna which on the 11th of March resulted in the resignation of the former chancellor and in the formation of a new cabinet. It is untrue that the Reich used forceful pressure to bring about this development. Especially the assertion which was spread later by the former chancellor that the German government had presented the federal president with a conditional ultimatum is a pure invention. According to the ultimatum, he had to appoint a, propo a proposed candidate as chancellor and to form a cabinet conforming to the proposals of the German government. Otherwise, the invasion of Austria by German troops was held in prospect. The truth of the matter is, that the question of sending military or police forces from the Reich was only brought up when the newly formed Austrian cabinet addressed a telegram already published by the press to the German government, urgently asking for the dispatch of German troops as soon as possible in order to restore peace and order and to avoid bloodshed. Faced with the immediately threatening danger of a bloody civil war in Austria, the German government then decided to comply with the appeal addressed to it. This being the state of affairs, it is impossible that the attitude of the German government, as asserted in your letter, could lead to some unforeseeable reaction. A complete picture of the political situation is given in the proclamation which at noon today the German Reich Chancellor has addressed to the German people. Dangerous reactions to this situation can take place 
only if eventually a third party should try to exercise its influence contrary to the peaceful intentions and legitimate aims of the German government on the shaping of events in Austria, which would be incompatible with the right of self-government of the German people. That ends the quotation. Now, in the light of the evidence which has already been presented to the tribunal, this version of the events given by the defendant von Neurath is a, a hollow mockery of the truth. We have learned from the portions quoted from document 178 OPS, USA exhibit number 72, Yodel's diary, the entry for March 10, 1938, the fact that von Neurath was taking over the duties of the foreign office while Ribbentrop was detained in London that the Fuhrer wished to send an ultimatum to the Austrian cabinet, that he had dispatched a letter to Mussolini of his reasons for taking action, and that army mobilization orders were given. We have seen the true facts about the ultimatum from two different documents. I refer to 812 PS, USA exhibit number 61, the report of Gauleiter Reiner to Reich Commissar Bertel, dated 6 July 1939, which was transmitted to the defendant's size inquiry on 22 August 1939. The portion reporting on the events of March 11 have already been read to the tribunal. I also refer to document 2949 PS USA Exhibit 76, the transcripts of Goering's telephone conversation, relative portions of which I have already read to the tribunal. These documents emphatically show, and with unmistakable clarity, that the Nazis, the German Nazis, did present an ultimatum to the Austrian government <coughs> that it would send troops across the border if Schusnig did, did not resign and if defendant Seiss Inquart were not appointed chancellor. These documents also show that the impetus of the famous telegram came from Berlin and not from Vienna. That Goering himself composed the telegram and Seiss Inquart did not even have to send it but Milley said, agree. The transcripts of Goering's telephone calls also <laughs> included the telephone call between Goering and Ribbentrop, indicated as part W of that document, in which the formula was developed and recited for English consumption, that there had been no ultimatum and that the German troops crossed the border in response only to the telegram. And now in this, this document from which I've just read, we find the same bogus formula coming from the pen of the defendant von Neurath. He was at the meeting of November 5, 1937, of which we have the horseback minutes, United States Exhibit 25, and so he knew, he knew very well the firmly held Nazi ideas with respect to Austria and Czechoslovakia. And yet in the period after March 10, 1938, when he was handling the foreign affairs for this conspiracy, and particularly after the invasion of Austria, he played out his part in making false representations. He gave an assurance to Mr. Mastny regarding the continued independence of Austria. I refer to the document introduced by Sir David Maxwell Fife, document TC 27, GB Exhibit 21. 
and we see him here still handling foreign affairs, although using the letterhead of the Secret Cabinet Council, as the exhibit shows. Reciting this diplomatic fable with respect to the Austrian situation, a story also encountered by us in the transcript of the Goering Ribbentrop telephone call, all in furtherance of the aims of what we call the conspiracy.